One thing I love about the site reliability engineering or SRE role is that there's lots of ways to get there. Some engineers come to it from traditional ops and sysadmin backgrounds, and others from software engineering and developer roles. This diversity is really great for SRE teams because the broader your experience, the better you're able to think about failure and reliability and to deal with incidents when they arise. But getting everyone on the same page and growing together can be a challenge in diverse teams. Where do you start? How do you ensure that you don't have gaps in knowledge? In this episode, we'll cover a useful tool for growing your SRE practice, the hierarchy of reliability, sometimes called the SRE pyramid. So a quick bit of history and context. Healthcare in the United States is awful. So when Barack Obama became president in 2009, one of his goals was to improve the healthcare system. And part of that was the creation of healthcare.gov, a government website that would allow people to easily purchase medical insurance. When the website launched, it was plagued with incidents and outages. Some engineers decided to leave Google's SRE team in order to help fix the website, and they developed this service reliability hierarchy. It's often called a pyramid because the skills build on each other, and mastering each of these areas sequentially, from the bottom to the top, is a great way to grow your SRE practice. I'll briefly cover each of these areas, then go into each area individually in future videos. The foundation of the pyramid is monitoring. It's impossible to address reliability if you have no way of knowing whether your application or service is even functioning. When I think about monitoring, I actually like to break it down into four parts that I've seen represented as LMAO. It's not laughing my ass off, but logs, metrics, alerts, and observability. Metrics help you understand the current state of your system within the context of past behavior. For example, in a metrics graph, I can see that my CPU is at 80%, and historically, this is higher than expected. That context is useful for generating alerts, so you'll know that something may be malfunctioning and can begin the incident response process, the next level of the pyramid. Observability is most commonly implemented as tracing. Tracing allows you to follow an event, such as a request, from service to service, and often from function to function within a particular service. This allows you to home in on the source of a problem. And once you've identified a problematic service, logs can provide the additional information about the problem that you need to resolve it. And that all leads to incident response. You'll need logs, traces, and metrics to troubleshoot issues. But incident response is much larger than just troubleshooting. It also encompasses how you structure your on-call processes, how you declare incidents, escalate them, and manage them. I think incident response can be summed up in two concepts, empower and communicate. Incident response is an emergency act, and the primary goal is to remediate the situation, to get things back to a normal operating state. The biggest hindrances to accomplishing this are when engineers don't have the information to act or lack the ability to act. As you build your maturity in this area, you need to consider how you can further empower your responders with information and authority. The second important concept is communication. Communication facilitates the information for empowerment, but it also makes others aware of what's going on, and this helps set expectations. Ultimately, it builds trust within your organization and with your customers. The postmortem or root cause analysis area is next. And there's a lot to cover in this section, starting with just those terms, postmortem and root cause analysis. So I'll save that for the video dedicated to this area. 
But if I could summarize this layer of the pyramid in just one word, that word would be learning. And I just lost the light, didn't I? As engineers, we're problem solvers. And that means it's easy to focus on fixing things. What are the action items we can do to prevent this incident? But often that leads to the wrong conclusions, especially when management is involved, because they are also problem solvers. They're just problem solvers with people. And this can quickly lead to blaming engineers. For example, I just realized that light went out back there. Jason forgot to charge the light. Uh, and so when incidents come up, if Jason's responsible for those mistakes that lead to outages, we should just fire Jason. By focusing on learning, we can gain a better understanding of what data and information we need to make better decisions. We can identify areas where we need safeguards or automation. And those lead to the next layer, testing and release procedures. By learning from incidents, we can build tests and design procedures to begin preventing errors before they're introduced into production. Testing is an inflection point in our reliability practices. It's where we shift from thinking about how we respond to incidents to how we can be more proactive about reliability. As we become more proactive, we enter the next area of the pyramid. It's titled capacity planning, but it's really more about adopting a reliability-oriented approach to system architecture. How can you design systems to handle scaling and potential overloads? How can you architect them to avoid cascading failures? As you design your applications, one piece of advice I have is to really take advantage of your cloud provider. Often we design our systems around the organizational structures within our companies. And this was noted in Conway's law. And when we do this, it can lock us into certain architectural choices because we're forced to divide work to accommodate these teams and these organizational structures. There are a lot of tools available that help with reliability and scalability. And sometimes we have to reorient how we think about our systems so that we can take advantage of them. That leads to the next area, development. Changes in architecture and design usually lead to changes in development. Not just how we do development, but the code itself often needs to change. And at this point, you've moved beyond our original topic of growing your SRE practice. If you're talking with developers and software engineers about reliability, then you're starting to build an organizational culture of reliability. And building a culture of reliability helps you reach the summit of the pyramid, product. A culture of reliability means that your product teams aren't just thinking about what features your customers want, but also about how to make those features reliable and how to deliver them reliably. There's a lot to cover in the hierarchy of reliability, so thanks for sticking with me. As mentioned, I'll dive into each area individually in upcoming episodes. But before we get into those, I wanted to ask you, where are you in the pyramid? What layer do you need to build and master to continue your reliability journey? If you wanna be notified when I add episodes going into each of these areas, click the subscribe button below and if you'd like for me to cover a particular subject or a question, leave a comment. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next episode.